planetary emits. And have been to one. Ooh, a lot more than I thought. So then the first couple parts will go really quick. We're going to uh, tell you what a planetarium is, what we do, and how we use Blender to make shows for planetariums. All right, so this is the Casper Planetarium, where I'm from in the United States, Wyoming. Um, planetariums come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes. Where I'm from, we have a very small planetarium with a um, nine meter radius dome. Um, that's really small. Most people have much larger ones. What we have is a single projector system. So we have a projector in the middle of the room and it uses a fisheye lens to project onto the dome. Other planetariums will have multiple projectors projecting on half the dome to get more resolution. Um, but originally what planetariums were used for, they just have a kind of a big metal ball in the middle of the room that would have pinpoints for light to make stars cast on the dome. And that's why there's a dome shape. Because um, it makes it, because the, the night sky looks kind of like a dome. And so when we're teaching astronomy about stars and constellations, it's easier if we can use a dome. But more and more, we're using planetariums for other types of science, astronomy, um, physics shows like that. So we'll run movies on them. But we can't run uh, the traditional square format. So what I have here is the scene from one of our shows that we made called Exoplanets of a radio telescope. And down here, I was giving an example. So we'll have the normal like 1020 or uh, 1920 by 1080 square camera, right? So we. Oh, oh. 19,000, all right. Anyway, so we have the, the square movie format. You can already kind of guess, since you've been to a planetarium before, if we were to project that onto the dome, it would be all warped and stretched. I wonder if we can just close this. All right. Um, so what we have to do is Blender comes with a, a nice camera to help us out with that. So, go to our camera, 1920 by 1080. First thing we'll do is we'll make it a square format, like 1024 or 1025. And then we'll go over to the camera settings, right, with the camera selected, and we'll click panoramic. And then for domes, uh, I don't know what the default is, but I think it's fisheye equidistant. And that produces images that look like this. So it, it warps what you may think of the image looking like. And on the dome, so down here, this will be what we call the horizon all the way around. What that translates to on the dome <coughs> is the bottom part of the dome all the way around. And then anything in the middle of the frame up here, that's what we call the zenith, the very top of the dome. And so that'll show up on the ceiling all the way straight up from the sky. And so I guess I can show a couple of examples real quick. So we have just our our normal one, if we were to shoot that with a normal camera, you can kind of see how that's very strange. If you were sitting down here, let's say, um, say you were sitting in the back row, the top of the radio telescope would be all the way behind you. And so that's why we change it to be warped, like that. So then it's in front of you. Um, 
And then the second part, he's going to talk about how kind of that minor change of going from flat screen to full 360 means a lot of reworking um, things in Blender and also some of the other challenges that come with larger uh, screen dimensions and computer processing and things like that. And we'll come back and talk about what we've done in Blender for Blend Terms. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Arthur Wolf. Uh, this will be also really quick here. Uh, so, uh, Jan uh, said something about what Fuldom is, but I, I will try to um, illustrate uh, what, uh, what is challenging in Fuldom. So part two, challenges of Fuldom. Uh, the first thing is that full dome is extremely expensive. Uh, let, let this images be self-explanatory. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go too much into details, uh, uh, given that you probably don't want to own a planetarium. <laughs> so, uh, domes. Uh, standard domes. Uh, Dome is something required <laughs> for planetarium. Certain domes are really high in diameter. Uh, uh, in Austin, uh, which I worked for Austin Planetarium, there's a 15 meter do uh, diameter dome. Uh, and in Casper, like Jan said, it's like uh, nine, right? Uh, sometimes uh, planetarium ha have also production domes to test uh, something. Uh, because uh, in planetariums, uh, uh, mostly shows are uh, going constantly. There, uh, there, there are constant screenings, and you cannot test uh, online. You, you don't have the the main dome online all the time. So you have to test something on production dome, uh, see what's uh, what's where, uh, and full dome projectors. Uh, this is uh, really vital. Uh, any setup that covers the entire dome with a full dome frame can be a full dome projector. In, a pl in planetariums, usually there are two or more projectors for the main dome. Uh, it's a difference between the, the system. Uh, in older planetariums, there are uh, mostly uh, single projector systems, and in the modern ones, there are multiple projector systems. Well, this projector probably costs more than my home. Uh, it's uh, one of the Sony's model. Uh, uh, another thing, uh, what what is costly in full DOM is that render from software and support expenses. So installation of a multiple projector system, full DOM system configuration. Uh, an example: aligning projectors output on the DOM to create seamless hemispherical image as blending. So you have projectors. Uh, that are screening parts of the image on the dome, and you have to align them seamlessly uh, so that the image is uh, uh, Im image is uh, seamless, just like this. Uh, maintenance on nearly always requires professional service. There are uh, companies all over the world which are uh, doing this uh, professional uh, offering this, this services from, for planetariums. Uh, another concern in full dome is that uh, there are humans uh, amounts of data here. Full dome shows are usually 40, uh, 30 minutes long averagely. And to illustrate uh, how, uh, uh, mm, how huge uh, amount of data is here, uh, there's a uh, let me just read. Most of the shows are 4K. Uh, so this is the resolution. It's it's always squared for the uh, for the Fisheye equidistant uh, lenses. Uh, for instance, there are some 2K uh, movies, for it's mostly by smaller planetariums, and there are only 11 8K shows available. Uh, this is information based on uh, 18 October, but I can put uh, today's dates, and probably nothing changed. Uh, only 11 8K shows. As, because there are problems with computing full dome. Uh, 40 minute 4K shows is uh, uh, 40,000 frames at 40 FPS. 
and it's months of render time because it's uh, 4,000 per 4,000 pixels per frame. And planetariums without proper computing power are forced to render their shows only at 2K or even, uh, even 1K resolution. Uh, for example, in Alston, we uh, were rendering uh, our show at 4K and then quickly switched to 2K because it was impossible. Uh, I know that uh, Jan uh, rendered uh, exoplanets at 2K resolution because of lack of proper computing power. Uh, good thing to know is that um, flat screen creations are always superior to the full dome ones. Uh, full dome suffers from decreased brightness, contrast, color issues, and the fact that every dome projection system is different. Even aging of separate projectors reigns picture quality because uh, if one projector uh, ages, then you'll see it uh, like image is no longer seamless. Uh, th th there are two different kind of images on the dome. So every frame has to be tested to domes. Previews are necessary. So some of them will com look completely different than the ones on computer screens. Uh, this is a brief explanation of what is brightness, contrast. Uh, uh, probably uh, all of you know what word it is. As amount of light, it's a, in the context of full dome, so uh, brightness here is the amount of light produced by the projector, and contrast is the range of difference between black and white and shades of color. Uh, and these factors are factors that cannot be looked in at individually because, example one, <laughs> projector might be very bright, but this will often result with a, rel a relatively low contrast, as you can see. Uh, our uh, night sky oh, I'm seeing it better on a computer screen but you can you have some uh, perception of it uh, our night sky will well it's almost white uh, this is more uh, popular in, uh, in planetariums uh, ex that extremely high contrast come at the expense of brightness and color saturation uh, that means that our image is so dark that you uh, hardly see any details. Right. There's uh, one uh, very funny thing in full dome, and this is uh, due to characteristics of the dome. It's a light pollution uh, in a micro scale called cross bounce. Light hitting the screen is bouncing back of it. The light is not just going into the eyes of the audience, it's going all over the room, including the opposite side of the dome. So you have the dome and the projectors uh, produces the, uh, the light and this light is not returning back to you. It's, it's hitting the dome uh, all the way on the room and it's, uh, it produces this uh, effect and uh, lits uh, the uh, lit the uh, lit the the elements of the dome that uh, hadn't um, that shouldn't been lit. So it's a problem. It can be n be avoided by uh, reconstructing, repainting the dome, uh, having a dome with proper ma uh, having the dome constructed with proper material. Uh, is it possible to do anything without dome? Well, you will probably uh, uh, answer it uh, yourself. But I would just say that full dome production studios, including planetariums, selling shows, have to make sure their testing dome and projectors are not poorly designed or configured. Uh, there was one show produced by uh, a Warsaw uh, planetarium, uh, Heaven's Copernicus Studios. Uh, they made a dream to fly, and anybody, anybody saw it? Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, they made the show, and uh, uh, they had very dark projectors, poorly designed or on or and or configured, uh, and uh, they uh, pumped up the brightness so much that on in some planetariums. Uh, it's just too shiny. Uh, and different types of content require different configuration. Brightness contrast are very important to astronomy, 
but explaining marine life is a different matter. Even in a planetarium, we need to keep a balance between a QLT night sky and playback of other types of content. I think this is self-explanatory. Uh, transitions uh, are things that are especially challenging in full dome, because shows with fast cuts, zooms, and crazy camera are impossible to watch. Most of the shows are made with a camera moving at a very slow pace. Peaceful transition is very hard to maintain each shot interesting. Uh, because um, the dome is so huge that it, for a moment, it replaces reality for you. And imagine uh, that uh, you have this image uh, projected in, in on, a, on a whole room uh, so that it replaces uh, our reality. And if you, uh, if you have your reality uh, beaten up with Hollywood cats, you will vomit. <laughs> uh, flash, should sudden brightness changes, forget about it. Unless you are really experienced in full dome, it won't work. Dome is too big, like I said before, too big to change environment so quickly and doesn't make viewers dizzy. That's some copyright claims. Oh, yeah. uh, that's it. And now we will move to part number three. Uh, I will show you what I did in Olsztyn, in Poland, and then Jan will uh, show you what he did at Casper, Wyoming. Uh, so we opened a window in, to the Fulham world in Olsztyn with Blender. That's why we are here. Uh, City of Olsztyn wanted to uh, promote uh, Olsztyn in some uh, more exotic way and Showing a planetarium was felt like a good idea, so we did it. Uh, and this is the city of Olsztyn. Uh, it's a good image. Uh, and this uh, is a this is our planetarium in Olsztyn. Uh, the diameter of the dome is uh, 15 meters. It's pretty huge. Uh, it has uh, two JVC projectors. Simple as that. And Blender can do that. Uh, these are um, uh, frames that we made. Uh, the whole movie is uh, is a combination of uh, of real shots and uh, with combined 3D elements. Uh, so this, these are full dome frames. Uh, yeah, it's fisheye. Uh, this is how it looks on the dome. Uh, this artifact on the center is an old size projector that uh, once projected uh, stars, monochromatic stars in the planetarium. Now full dome is mostly used for it. Well, so this is huge. Uh, you see it and it's wow. Oh, that's it. Casper, Wyoming, at the Casper Planetarium, where I'm from, uh, I made this show um, with our team there called Exoplanets, a show about exoplanets. So what I was trying to do with it, one is make a show for the planetarium about exoplanets, a show that at the time wasn't a very um, broad topic. There wasn't a lot of shows about exoplanets, so I wanted to fill that gap in the planetarium industry. Um, in some of our other shows, um, we make on Adobe After Effects, but um, that costs money. So I was using uh, Blender for things, and I wanted to be able to make the entire show in Blender, essentially from start to finish. So model everything, render everything, and then use the compositor and the video editor to put it all together. And then what I have here is the show is about 30 minutes long, so then I just took clips of that and cut it into about a three minute section. We're not going to watch the whole video because a lot of it is just credits, um, just to give you an idea of what the show looked like. Um, it's also warped, so these are the full dome frames, so you can just kind of try to imagine what it would look like on the dome. And I think I have 
have some sleep. Humans have long dreamed of planets orbiting stars and systems other than ours. In 1991, astronomers Alexander Volchan and Dale Frail detected regular deviations in the radio beam from a pulsar, PSR B1257 plus 12, approximately 980 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Virgo. They determined an object orbiting the pulsar was causing the star to wobble, therefore slightly shortening and lengthening the times between the beacons. The radio velocity method, or Doppler spectroscopy, has been a productive method for detecting exoplanets. 51 Pegasi is much like our Sun in size, temperature, and luminosity. Its planet, officially named 51 Pegasi b, was also given the nickname gravity limits the mass an animal could attain before it collapsed under its own weight. Flight would be significantly more difficult and would probably be based more on buoyancy. On Earth, birds, insects, and bats flap their wings to gain lift. On Gliese 667 cc, animals would likely fly by ballooning and displacing a significant amount of air around them. From the surface of B, during closest approach, C looms menacingly large in the sky, appearing two and a half times the apparent diameter of the moon from Earth. B is then caught in a gravitational tug of war, the nearby gas giant pulling one way, and the more distant star the other. The tidal forces contort the surface, the first and the planet is consumed planet in earthquakes and volcanism, was Fomalo B whose orbit is extremely distant. Fomalo b is a gas giant approximately twice the mass of Jupiter. It most likely is subject to an ongoing bombardment of comets and asteroids, leaving it enveloped in clouds of dust and debris. More than six planets. Now, scientists have discovered thousands. And that's only in our small, humble region of our moderately sized galaxy. It is an exciting time in astronomy with new discoveries constantly feeding our desire to explore. switching your camera type and you guys can make them too free and open source all in blender everything you need you can make your own planetarium shows um, so I don't know how much time do we have left or, um. so all right so if we have some time left over uh, we were going to talk about um, possible improvements for Blender to make it a little bit easier to make full dome and also open it up to questions So if anybody has any questions at any point in time just ask them um, And if not, we'll keep going with this Yep Yes. 
Yes. So I think, I think I understand what you're saying. So originally, so if we go over here, go to this scene. Ideally, what we want to best simulate it, what kind of stems from what the, the dome was made for, is just looking straight up at the night sky. But when we want to put images on, um, it's easier to represent things if we tilt the camera forward uh, instead of having it straight up. Um, I don't know why it's thinking right now. but So when we tilt the camera forward with that fisheye, it kind of it puts what we have, what our focus wants to be, kind of in the middle of that warped frame. But if we were to look to the dome off to the side, it starts angling things, making it um, kind of weird. You'll have like candlesticks or windows or something angled to the side instead of straight up and down. Um, and that's one of the challenges with uh, 3D domes, or uh, just domes in general. Um, if you're not doing something that's completely space-based or full sky, uh, off to the side, things can look weird. Uh, one way around this, kind of, is to have a tilted dome. So we can, some planetariums, uh, and it's more and more that the dome itself will be tilted uh, 10 to 30 degrees like that um, and the chair is kind of layered um, and what that does is it makes it so that the the zenith isn't necessarily straight up anymore it's more uh, in front of you so you have more room to play with and it kind of negates those effects um, so I, I could I think um, that's kind of what you were saying. Oh, yeah, so like in Blender itself, if we were to, let's say, set this one, I think this is the dome cam. If we were to look through the camera, in Blender it just looks straight up because that's where the camera is pointing. Um, but when it renders, it'll render the um, the warped version. And kind of how we have to do it, our workaround for being able to place camera, see if our tilt is right, see if our objects are in the field of view, is we just have to go into rendered view and luckily um, it warps it if we go into rendered view and then we can just uh, control our camera from a different one to see how it, how it fixes that position of the, the dome. Um, and that was actually one of the things that we were going to talk about. Um, there's no viewport support, really. So if you want to do open geo rendering, um, it's not really an option for planetariums because when you look through the camera, it's just looking straight up where the camera's aim uh, aiming. There's no warping of it. And so um, we understand that development is hard and may not necessarily be able to be done, but if it could, that'd be one thing we would like. Um, yep, viewport warping things. Um, also, it's only for cycles where you have the that option to switch the camera. Um, in Blender Render, uh, some people have made different plugins, um, but there are some issues that come with those plugins to be able to warp the, the camera. And in the compositor, um, there's also no way to um, warp images that you want to put. So if I wanted to add 
some image over the top of like an astronomer or something, a square image projected onto a dome as we saw warps all the edges and so it looks funny. A uh, way around that is to essentially mimic what the camera is doing and warp the image to fit it. Um, but if you're adding an image in, in the compositor, uh, it's, it's a bit more tricky to warp it properly. Any other questions? Yep. So, not, not really any mainstream things like that. Uh, there are a lot of uh, inflatable planetariums, so small planetariums that you can inflate and they use those to bring to schools in uh, places that won't have any, and small projectors that'll do that, but that's about as close as you can get to an individual uh, kind of planetarium experience is some of these smaller inflatable domes, but even then, that plus the projector kind of costs uh, a good amount of money. Um, and because of all these costs, most planetariums are publicly funded. Um, but what we try to do in the Casper Planetarium is we try to teach Blender to as many students as we can and give them the opportunity to make full dome content. Um, because Blender's free and open source, anybody can just change the camera type and make a show for the planetarium. So we try to teach our kids in the community to, to be able to do that and um, either one, come work for us, or two, just be able to watch something on the dome that they created. he said different types of paints on the dome can help with reducing the, the bounce back light. Um, it's just an, a thing to be aware of when you're making a show. Sometimes if you have a, kind of a grassy field on one side and the sky on the other, the sky is going to be much brighter and that will be on the back of the dome and so that light will go on the front of the dome lighting it up. So what you can do is just um, post processing uh, correct for those types of things. Um, I don't know of any automatic way, but what? Yeah. Um, yeah, r really, uh, at least as far as I know, in the, in the industry, most uh, people who make content for it and most people who have domes uh, just realize that that's a thing. Uh, that's an effect that can happen in some scenes, the, the cross bounce of light, and so um, in larger planetariums, it may not be such an issue as in smaller planetariums, um, but you can just edit the image in post-processing, contrasts, things like that, to try to negate that effect if it happens. Um, so most of the time, uh, the planetarium, we'd want things to be as accurate as possible. So um, actually what, 
what we have here. Um, the first what I had at the So the, that was the whole point of having the dome in the, the first place is to have accurate positions of all the stars and be able to draw the lines as you would be able to see in the night sky. So this is actually uh, tonight's night sky here in Amsterdam. So if there wasn't so much light pollution, you went outside, looked, let's say, south, straight up, you would see... Um, Ursa Major, Draco, those kinds of constellations. Um, so yeah, we, we try to make them as accurate as possible. Um, from, And that, that just comes from softwares where you can get uh, images of stars and stuff like that. Or softwares, they'll come with the projectors that can project stars like that. Um. Mm -hmm. Any other questions?